So, uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, today we have to end our message series on the book of Acts. So um, I don't know who the unfortunate is for and the fortunate is for. Um, but today is going to be the last sermon um, in our message series titled Acts. So over the weeks we've been looking at, um, we've not been looking at each chapter of, of the book of Acts. So what we've been doing is that we pick some highlights right from um, Acts chapter 1. And today we are going to end with um, Acts chapter 19. So we are not ending with Acts chapter 28. And um, I think there is something very interesting um, happening in Acts chapter 19, which we would all of us um, love to uh, hear. So if you've been paying a close attention, you would realize that almost any time Paul would go to... So Acts, from Acts chapter 1 to chapter 12 is basically focused on, mostly on Peter and also, of course, the other apostles, but, but mostly on Peter. And right from Acts chapter 12, the focus, Luke shifts his focus to Paul. So from chapter 12 all the way till the end of the book of Acts, the focus is on, is on Paul. And if you've, if you've been paying attention in the last few weeks, you would realize that almost any time Paul goes to a place, almost any time he goes to a new place, one of the things he does as part of preaching the gospel, or sometimes even before preaching the gospel, is that he, first of all, addresses the idols of those cities or the idols in that culture. Not only address them, he challenges them and he exposes them. So, for example, uh, I think two weeks ago, Kuhn spoke about Paul in Philippi. And then you see that he's addressing um, an idol. And then in, um, I think, last week's sermon, um, Kuhn again spoke about Acts chapter 17, where you see Paul addressing idols in Athens. And then in Acts chapter 19, you see the same thing happening. Paul addressing, um, indirectly addressing an idol um, in, in Ephesus. And I think this is important because what it means is that there is a possibility that one can believe in Jesus or one can believe the gospel and still carry along with the idols of their culture if those idols are not addressed, exposed, and challenged. It's possible. So, for example, you often see people come to faith. They say, you know, I am born again. You know, I am now a believer in Christ and all of that. And then you look at their lives and it's no different from those who are not believers. And I think this has been the biggest scandal in the Christian church. This has been the biggest criticism, that there are a lot of Christians who don't live like as what they preach. So it's possible to carry along with the idols. And I think that is the reason why Paul would, almost everywhere he went, he would first address the idols and then give the gospel. So that's what I'm going to try and show you um, in this in this chapter. So I'm going to read for you Acts chapter 19. I'll be reading. It's a long passage, but I hope you would uh, follow along. It's a very interesting one. Acts 19, the verse 23 to the verse 41. I'm going to read. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business, and you see and hear how this fellow, Paul, has convinced and led astray a large number of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divinity, of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions, 
from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they, shouted, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quietened the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that this city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and, for, and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed, blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open. There are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you this morning, Lord. We praise you for who you are. We, we thank you that we can listen to your word again. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, you will speak to me and also through me. And Lord, may you speak to all of us. May you open our hearts, Lord, to be able to receive your word. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my sermon today is Paul in Ephesus, the same idols, the same gospel. Paul in Ephesus, the same idols, the same gospels. And there are four things I would like to share with you from this um, passage. So first of all, I'm going to share with you the basis for idols. And then second, the emptiness of idols. And third, the power or the powerful nature of idols. And lastly, the hope of the gospel. You can combine the second and the, and the third uh, point uh, to make it three in total, just to be fair. So basis for idols, and then second and third, idols are empty, yet they are powerful. And lastly, the hope of the gospel. So we start with the basis for idols. You know, often you hear people say, uh, the secular narrative is this, religion poisons everything, you know, our ancestors made up religion. Religion was not part of us, but our ancestors came up with the idea of religion, the idea of God, in order to be able to cope with the sufferings of this world, in order to be able to, you know, sort of come up with answers for the things that we don't really have answers to. So religion has been made up, you know, it's all in our minds, and it has nothing to do with us intrinsically and all of that. You hear that often. But is this really the case? And I would argue that this is not the case. Why? Because one of the biggest evidence is that we know from research that you can actually elicit religious experiences by biochemical and neurological means. So you can, in other words, religious experiences do have biological foundations. And there is one popular book on this, which actually the title is Why We Can Never Do Away With God. Looking at the brain, uh, the relationship between brain and religiosity or spirituality. But not only that, there is also behavioral evidence suggesting that we are intrinsically, intrinsically we have these impulses towards religion, towards being religious. So there are some religious-like um, experiences that we all pursue, whether you are a believer or not, whether you are a secular person or a religious person, we all pursue within us some religious-like experiences. And one Canadian clinical um, psychologist put it in a very beautiful way. This is what he says, talking about giving examples of how we pursue, we humans pursue religious-like experiences. 
He says this, we feel awe towards beauty. We feel awe to the ideal. We participate in mass worship of sports prowess. We like to see people hit the target, which is the opposite of sin, which is to miss the target. We get enraptured by gospel-oriented rock performances in a stadium. And we do that with other people, and it fills us with enthusiasm, which means to be filled with God, because that's what the word, that's what the word enthusiasm actually means. And he goes on to say, we feel awe towards actions people undertake, especially if they are radically altruistic or radically truthful. And the list goes on. The point he's making is that we all pursue these religious-like experiences, which then suggests that intrinsically we, we have these religious impulses and we all fundamentally as humans want to be religious. And so the, the, the wise man, King Solomon, was right when he said that God has set eternity in our hearts. Now, if we have these intrinsic religious impulses, then what it means is that if we try to get rid of the idea of God, right? We are not all together getting rid of God, but we are going to replace him with an idol. That is what it means, because we are bound to worship. There are biological foundations for that, and in all the things that we pursue, they indicate that we lean towards all these religious experiences. So when we get rid of God in our minds, we are not really getting rid of God. We, re we replace the, G, the capital G God with a small g God, idol. And so the first commandment God gives was that, do not have any other God before me. And that is idols. Idols, basically, to have an idol is basically to put something. It can be a good thing to make something else more important than God. So taking something which is good, God created, a created thing, and then making it more important than God. If we go back to this passage, in the verse... In the verse 26, this is what is happening. It's a very, very fascinating statement. And by the way, this is the only time you see Luke recording something in which the gospel is not preached or some part of the gospel is not mentioned by an apostle. Anytime the gospel is being preached in the, in the gospel of um, in the, in the Acts, it is being preached by an apostle. But this time, it is not an apostle. We don't hear any apostle talking. Paul is not talking. It is Demetrius and the people around him and the city clerk who are talking. And then this is what Demetrius says, the one who leads the riot. He says, there is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name. The verse 26, sorry. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says, that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. Gods made by human hands are no gods at all. I mean, what is wrong with this statement? If you and I have the power to create gods, are they really gods? If you can make a god, does that item or object continue to be god if you made it? Right? But this is what they're having problem with. And you might think that, you know, it's these ancient people. They were primitive. You know, they didn't know anything. They were naive. And so they make all these idols. But it's the same. And actually, this is the reason why I titled my sermon, Same Idols, Same Gospels. It hasn't changed. The same people Paul was addressing are the same people we have in our time. Because nothing has changed. What they did in the open, we do in the secret. They were overt about making physical idols to bow down to. We are covert about the idols that we worship. And I'll show you why. You know, they, and we saw, it, we saw it last week as well. But the point they are making is that idols, he is having, Demetrius and the people are having problem with the fact that gods made by, made by men are no gods at all. But this is the same narrative we hear in our time from the postmodern world. You can't tell anybody that there is one true God because that's arrogant. Everyone has the chance to make for themselves their own gods. Put differently, everyone, there is no such a thing as ultimate meaning, ultimate purpose of life, something that we all have to live for. Everyone 
has to create their own meaning. Everyone has to create their own purpose and make sacrifices to live for such purpose and meaning. Does it sound differently from what Demetrius is saying or from what Paul is saying that God's created by men? We are advocating that people create their own meaning. Meaning is subjective, right? There is no ultimate meaning, ultimate purpose. You create your own meaning. You create your own purpose. And it's the same thing that Demetrius is having problems with. Paul says that meaning created. Because the thing about meaning is that whatever is your meaning in life, you are not only going to worship it, you are going to make sacrifices for it. Whatever your meaning is, and what the Greeks or what the ancient world would do is that they would make an image to represent what they are meaning, what they want to live for. And they would offer sacrifices to those things. We do the same in our time. So think, for example, someone who thinks that all I want to live for, the only thing, and this is how, by the way, you get to have an idea of what, an, what your idol may be. The very thing that absorbs your mind when you have nothing at all to think about your deepest nightmare, what you daydream about, they give you an indication of where your heart really is. So if someone says that if only I can be successful in my career, if only I can get this and become that, then I am going to know that I am successful. Then I am going to know that my life is fulfilled. Then I am going to know that my life has been meaningful. If that is what you say to your career, you are going to make all sacrifices, including sacrificing your own children and the relationship around you to that idol in order to get it. Let's take, for example, whatever, whatever your, your idol is, you make sacrifices to us. So they made it covert. They made it over. They made it in the open space. We make it covert. We make it in our heart. But it's the same thing that Paul is addressing. So, for example, if wisdom or being, look, being seen as a smart person is something that you really want to live for, you really want to strive for, then you have Athena, the Greek god of Athena, the god of wisdom, if money is what you really want to live for, you have Plutus, the Greek god Plutus. If um, beauty or sex, sexuality or love is what you really think you would really make you fulfilled and content and satisfied in life and you want to live for, you have Aphrodite, the Greek god. If childbirth is what you want to live for, then you have the god we see here, Artemis. In Roman, it's called Diana. So it's the same thing. What they were open about, we are covert about. Next point, emptiness of idols. Idols are empty. We see this in the verse 27. I read, There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Now, if Artemis was really God, right, why should Demetrius and the other people try to protect its divine majesty? Why should they try to defend the God? Then they let the God defend herself, right? But this is what is happening here. So gods, they are empty. They are empty because we know that whatever, whatever you look at and say that if only I can get it, right, then I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be fulfilled. You get it, and then you realize that it doesn't deliver its promise. You realize that, you begin to ask yourself, is that all there is? Because they are all created things. Because when you say that to a created thing, you are basically ascribing something that God can only give you, the satisfaction and the meaning that God can only give you to a something that has been created. I would like to quote Cynthia Heimel, who is an American author, and I think she passed away in 2018. But she was a very, a very funny writer. And I came across this quote for the first time from a book by Tim Keller um, titled The King's Cross, which is a commentary on the Gospel of Mark. And this is what she says. So she lives in New York, and she's, you know, been around um, celebrities for a very long time. She has seen them evolve, you know, from the, from, the, from the scratch, evolve all the way to fame and all of that. And this is what she writes about them. She says, I pity celebrities. No, I really do. Sylvester, he mentions, she mentions names. Sylvester Salon, Bruce Willis, and Barbara Streisand were once perfectly pleasant human beings. But now their wrath is awful. 
You see Sly, Bruce, Barbara, they all wanted fame. They worked hard. They pushed. And the morning after each of them became famous, they wanted to take an overdose. Because the giant thing they were striving for, that fame, that fame thing, that was going to make everything okay. That was going to make their lives bearable. That was going to provide them with personal fulfillment and happiness. It had happened, and they were still them. And then finally, she ends like this. I think when God wants to play a really rotten practical joke on you, he would grant you your deepest wish, and then you realize you want to kill yourself. Well, I don't believe God plays jokes on any of us. I don't believe God does that. But I think the point she's trying to make is valid. That when you look at anything, in, this, in the case of these guys, it was fame. They thought that, and she, she, she mentioned that she saw them working in bars and all of that, you know, trying to make it. And then they wanted to get that fame. They got the fame, and the very day they got the fame, they wanted to kill themselves. They wanted to take an overdose. And history has proven that. Because when you look at a created thing, the created thing doesn't have, if you can create an idol for yourself, any created thing, anything that is created within the universe does not have power to give you that personal fulfillment. And Paul was right in Romans chapter 1 when he's talking about the wrath of God. And then he says, I think about three or four occasions in that small passages, he says that, and God gave them over to their own pleasures. God gave them over to what they had really wanted to have. And he describes that in a way as the wrath of God, which means that the worst thing God can do to you and I is to give you what you really, really, really want because you will get it and you realize that it's all empty. And that is why idols are empty. So Paul is right. I believe Cynthia Heimel is right as well. Idols are empty and yet they are powerful. They are not just empty, but they are also powerful. Pay attention to the warning which is given by the city clerk, right? So there is riot in Ephesus because Demetrius and all the people he had brought together, you know, they were all against Paul and, you know, they are about to harm Paul and they were so furious as you could read. They became so angry that Paul was preaching that gods made by men are no gods at all. You see how possessive idols are to make them so angry, so furious to the extent that they caused a riot in the whole city of Ephesus for the city clerk to come in and make this statement. And then he says, these men, they have done nothing wrong. You are the ones causing the instability in the city and risking Roman punishment. And this is what he says in the, in the, chapter, in the verse uh, 40. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. The postmodern narrative is that religion or the statement that there is one true God is what is bringing about all the instability in our society. What is really making us retrogress and not progress is all these religious people all these people who think that, you know, they have the truth, who think that their God is true. How dare you say that? How offensive that is. It's the same thing that is happening here. And then the city clerk says that you think that the gospel is the cause of instability in Ephesus. And that is what is going to bring the downfall of Ephesus. Ephesus. But you are actually the ones who are going to bring the downfall of the city of Ephesus. That's what he's saying. He says, as it is, you are the ones who are causing this riot. And you are the ones who are going to make the Romans come on us. Not the gospel. Not Paul. Not the apostles. And it's the same argument being made in our time. That religion is what poisons everything. That, you know, and often when they talk about religion, they talk about the, you know, the traditional sense, sense of God. You know, claiming that God is just one, claiming that, you know, you, you are, um, God is exclusive. The Christian God is exclusive. That is offensive, and no one should do that. How dare you make, no one should make a claim that, you know, their God is exclusive. Anyone who makes any claim about God and make it ex exclusive is offensive and is intolerant. And yet the claim 
that don't make any claim about God. It's also about God, and they are making it exclusive. I mean, we live in a free country. We don't have to be consistent, right? But that is what is happening over here. And you see them being possessed by it. And this is what idols do. So going back to the example I gave, that if, if they are powerful in the sense that when idols possess you, you know, the Bible talks about principalities, rulers. Nice. She's paying attention to the same one. The Bible talks about principalities and rulers and authorities in high places. What is the Bible referring to? What is the Bible referring to? These are in idols, and it makes them possessive. Because they can possess you, they can make you do things that under normal circumstances you wouldn't do. And so for the person who lives for his or her career, they are going to make sacrifices, all sorts of sacrifices, including all the important relationships around them. And in the end, they will get a career and they will know it's empty and they will lose, lose everything, lose their relationships and then lose the satisfaction that they thought they were going to get from it. Think of spouses, for example. If I look at my wife and say to my wife that if only she can continue to love me, or assuming I'm not married, and then say that, you know, if only I can get a wife who is going to love me for who I am, who is, you know, who is perfect in character and all of that, then I'm going to feel fulfilled, then I'm going to feel content. Well, what it means is that because... Because contentment and deep fulfillment and true happiness is something that God can only give. So to look at a created thing and expect that the created thing, my spouse, is going to give me those fulfillment, what it means is that I am going to crush her with all these expectations. And two, she is going to underperform. And when she underperforms, before, because I was expecting her to meet those expectations and she underperforms, I am going to be frustrated. I am going to be furious. And that is what is happening to these people. So on one hand, I am crushing her. On the other hand, she's crushing me with her underperformance. So in the end, we lose everything. Idols, they are destructive. They are powerful. They have that power to destroy. And you can apply this to everything, everything. It can even be children, parents, children relationship. If what you say to yourself subconsciously is that if only my children can grow up and become like this and have this sort of character, become this person, that person, then I'm going to feel that I am happy. Then I'm going to feel that I have lived a meaningful life. If that is what you are saying, you are going to overwhelm your children with your expectations. They are going to disappoint you. And when they disappoint you, you will feel crushed. You can apply it to everything, including sermon, including me standing here and preaching to you. And one of the things I struggle with is that sometimes I preach here and then I get very, very good feedback, positive feedback. They are good things, right? But there is also that strong temptation for me to look forward to those good feedback that I'm going to get and place those feedback as being more important than what God will think of me. That becomes an idol if I choose to go that direction. Everything can be idolized. And that's what the Greeks and the Romans did. They would make an idol for it. We don't make an idol for it, yet we idolize, idolize them in our hearts. And they are going to demand sacrifices. You would have to sacrifice on those, for those idols. And when we fail to meet their expectations, they are not going to forgive us. Is there any hope? Yes, all the hope in the world. Because the gospel is our hope. So the last point, the hope of the gospel. The whole Bible is telling us a story of, you know, God created man, mankind, and God wanted to have that relationship with mankind. We lost it. And from Genesis 3, ever since we lost that relationship, we have always be, been on the search to redeem ourselves. All humanity have been on the search of redemption, and we seek the redemption in various things, whether in love, being respected, value, being successful at work. We seek redemption in so many things. In all of our endeavors, we are actually really, really seeking to redeem ourselves because we all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. We all want to be valued. And that's what the Bible says. We have always been making an attempt to redeem ourselves. And yet there is only one perfect redeemer who redeems us and brings us back into that perfect relationship which he designed for us. You see, what is happening in this passage is that Paul is risking his life. Like Demetrius says, that 
He said that Paul has convinced and led astray a large number of people here in Ephesus. So the point he's making is that Paul is saving a lot of people in the city of Ephesus. But Paul is risking his life to do this because the point of Demetrius is that we should kill Paul. We should get rid of him because he is bringing the downfall of the city of Ephesus. So Paul is risking his life at all costs to save the people of Ephesus. Now there was another man who did not just risk his life, but actually came at the cost of his life. He gave up his life so that he can redeem you and I. He gave up his life on the cross so that he would actually make all the idols powerless. And this is what Paul says again in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul says this, And having disarmed the powers, talking about Jesus, so I'll start from 14, having canceled the charge, he forgave us all our sins and having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. When Christ Jesus died on the cross, he made a public spectacle of those idols. And he disarmed them so that those idols cannot have a hold of us, of us, so that he would render them powerless. You know, the problem with idols, as St. Saint, Saint Augustine um, confesses to in, in, in his book, uh, Confessions, he says that the problem with idols actually has to do with, it has to do with love, right? The center of it all is love. We all want that love, and we want to give that love. But the problem with idols is disordered kind of love. So love has to be ordered. And if it becomes disordered, that is when we make an idol. So for example, we are supposed to love God above everything else. That's what God says, the very first commandment, do not have any idol, any other God before me. You love God first and foremost. Or take, for example, your family and your work, right? You are supposed to love your children more than your family, more than your, um, your work. If you disorder that kind of love and love your work more than your children, it's disordered love, and that makes your work an idol. So all forms of idols are as a result of disordered love. We are supposed to love God more than anything else, and if we love anything else more than God, it becomes an idol. So disordered kind of love, what it then means is that if we really want to get back to God, and make him the supreme and the most important person in our lives. It is not about, you know, then I have to do more to prove that, you know, I love God more. And by the way, the Pharisees made an idol out of religion. So it's even possible to make an idol out of the rules of God. God is not seeking people who would obey his rules. God is seeking people who would follow his heart. God, will see, God is seeking people who are open to receive him in their lives. So you can also make an idol out of religion itself. So how then do we go about it? It's only when we have understood the love of God. It's only when the love of God becomes more beautiful than the love of anything. Then it's easy to replace it. And psychologists do agree that to, to replace, you can't just do away with any habit. It, it doesn't work. You can't just say, I have stopped this habit. To stop a habit, habit, you have to replace that habit with something more beautiful than that previous habit. And this is how it works with the cross. Unless our imaginations and all our minds, all our thoughts are being filled with the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of Christ Jesus saying that I lay down my life for you. Not just for the whole world, although that is true, but that Christ Jesus specifically laid down his life for you and for me. When we begin to see that beauty, all idols will fail away. When we begin to see the love of God and say, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's love? Died he for me, who him till death pursue? Amazing love, how can this be that God, my Lord, should die? for me. Let us pray.